Welcome to the Icons, Leadership in Sports. I'm your host, Rick Harrow. Every month on the Icons, we deal with the biggest names in sports and get to the core of what makes them who they are. This month, we have one of the biggest personalities in the history of basketball, Hall of Famer and broadcasting legend, Bill Walton. Let's get started by going inside the Icon. Bill Walton was born and raised in San Diego. His father was a music teacher and social worker, and his mother was a librarian. Walton said neither of them ever had any interest in athletics. When he was just in high school, Walton was already playing local pickup basketball games with NBA players like Elvin Hayes, Rudy Tomjanovich, and Calvin Murphy. He played center for John Wooden at UCLA in the early 70s and was named NCAA Player of the Year three times. In addition to winning the two national titles, Walton was part of the Bruins' 88-game winning streak that remains a record to this day. In the NBA, Walton won two titles and was the MVP in 1978, playing 13 seasons for the Trailblazers, Clippers, and Celtics. Philanthropy has been an important part of Walton's life since his playing days. He's an ambassador for The Better Way Back, which counsels people how to manage chronic pain. He's also a longtime volunteer for the Challenged Athletes Foundation, which provides people with physical disabilities the opportunity to participate in sports. We sit down with Bill Walton in a high school gym in Oklahoma City. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Walton, we came into a gym, and I'm not sure if people are surprised because it's Bill Walton or this tall dude came into a practice. Which Rick, one was I'm the luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> I walked into my first gym when I was eight years old, and I have never left. I can't play anymore. 38 operations. Both my ankles are fused from the knee down. It's all one bone, can't feel a thing. Got a new knee, finally. And then my, I have a new spine as well. But uh, my hands and wrists don't work, but I'm alive and I am the luckiest guy in the world. I'm still in the gym. And today we got to walk in and see the future. I have a feeling this is gonna free flow a little bit. We'll forget this for a minute. Let's talk about your body. 38 surgeries? I'm doing great today. You're it today. hasn't always been the case. I was born with structural congenital birth defects in my feet, and I ground them into dust. When I was 14, I was down at the gym playing against some really old guys. They were in their 30s. I was torching them. They didn't like it. They took me down one, two, high, low. I had to have my first surgery at that point. When I was 21, January 7th, 1974, not that I remember the date, no, but no. I was high above the basket, making a play on the ball, hadn't lost a game in five years, and a guy on the other team in a despicable act of violence and dirty play came from the other side of the court, took my legs out from underneath me, catapulted through the air, bam, fell on the innovation of the day, a tartan floor, yeah. and broke two bones in my spine. And I lived with that broken, crooked, unstable foundation forever. And then, but I just kept going and did everything I could to sustain but then finally on february 24th 2008 not that you remember the date not that i remember the date but i, I could no longer move and yeah. i got off a plane and I, I could no longer function and i spent the next four and a half years on the ground in the hospital i had a pioneering experimental surgery on february 9th 2009 toughest thing that i've ever gone through in my life but I'm all better, Rick. I have no pain. I take no medication. I go full speed ahead. I've never been busier. I've never been happier. And I haven't been this healthy since I was 13 years old. What were the four and a half years like when you couldn't get off the floor? I wanted to kill myself yeah. because I could no longer function. And I could only describe the pain as being submerged into a vat of scalding acid that had an electrifying current running through it. I could never get out. Yeah. When one thing that I've lived with my whole life is the joint pain, the bone pain. Uh, but now with the fused ankles, that's gone. With the new knee, that's gone. With the spine surgery, that's gone. But the nerve pain, nerve pain is a completely different challenge and there's nothing that works on nerve pain and it never goes away. And it drives you to a deep, dark place yeah. where you can't think, you can't dream, there's no hope, you can't function, you can't eat, you can't sleep, you can't move, and that was me. So of all the people that I mentor with their health challenges, the, the first step is always to get out of the pain, and that for me required surgery. I tried every, I've never met anybody, Rick, yeah. 
who got up in the morning and said, hey, I think I'll just go have some spine surgery today. <laughs> I mean, this is not something that is nah, yeah. like, uh, yeah. you, you look forward to. But, were you, but, do, but it, how much pain were you in when you were playing? I was in well, constant pain, constant chronic pain, pain but yeah. you don't think about it. You yeah. just, you know, you think that's just the way life is. Yeah. I grew up thinking that everybody's feet hurt all the time because that's what mine did. To finish about Better Way Back because the whole idea of turning your pain right. into something positive uh, you know, for others. I, I try to live a life based on that things work out best for those that make the best out of the way things work out. Right. I try to live a life in service of the needs of others. I try to live a life of searching for possible opportunities to move the group forward. The nicest thing, Rick, that anybody ever said about me as a basketball player was that I helped make my teammates play better. Yeah. I was inspired in my life by Bill Russell, who was my favorite player ever on and off the court. And when I watched Bill Russell play as a child, when I was a child, when I became Bill Russell's friend, I'm his friend, I can't speak for him. I don't speak for other people, but uh, I learned from Bill that he spends his entire time trying to make a positive contribution in everything that he does to try to enable other people's dreams to come true. Bill Russell, my hero. He was a guy who was very grounded very focused, very determined. He took his responsibilities and duties very seriously. It was a, a remarkable experience and opportunity that I did not appreciate at the time. This is for every girl who hears people say she won't make it, but refuses to listen. For every girl who thinks not about what she has to lose, but about what she has to gain. This is for every girl who doesn't look like everyone who's come before, but may look like those who will follow. This is for every diamond in the sky. This is for every girl. My parents had zero interest in sports, still to this very day, right. no interest. I never shot a basket with my dad and saw him run one time at the church picnic and fell over laughing. My mom yeah. was our town's librarian. They just, sports is not their thing. But I had uh, this incredible world and culture that I grew up in that was fostered in sports by my first coach, Rocky, who was our town's fireman. He was a volunteer for 59 years at the same elementary school. Then Chick Hearn, greatest broadcaster yeah. ever. I found Chick on the radio when I was nine years old and then in the culture that I grew up and lived in, in the 50s and the 60s in San Diego, California, every coach, every teacher that I had was a disciple of John Wooden, yeah. who gave away everything that he had. I mean, he was this spiritual force of nature. And then the heroes and role models that I chose as a child, still to this very day, have maintained that position in their life. And that's a, a very affirmative aspect of a, of a person's life. The country was was torn apart uh, almost as much as it is today. Uh, it wouldn't, among everything else, to an outsider, proves that two men can love each other even be, though they have different political and life philosophies. I did not understand, Rick, anything that Coach Wooden was talking about. Yeah, I thought he was crazy. Yeah, yeah. You know, we were teenagers and we had such incredible success at early ages. And we set all the records when we were playing at UCLA that still stand to this day. Yeah. And he was a guy who was very grounded, very focused, very determined. He took his responsibilities and duties very seriously. It was a, a remarkable experience and opportunity that I did not appreciate at the time. I had a perfect childhood, even though I had the health challenges even yeah. then, even though I had my stuttering challenges. but. Uh, Basketball, the easiest part of my life ever. Academics, super easy. My challenges were the orthopedic problems and then my speech impediment. But I was, I was 21 years old. I, I had never encountered anybody that didn't have little Billy's best interest at heart. Yeah. And, right. and then I joined the NBA right. and everything changed. And I didn't realize what I had missed. I didn't realize the errors of my way until 
I left UCLA. And then I got out there and it was like, whoa, things are different here. But John Wooden did a great job of preparing you for life after college. You just didn't know it. I didn't. I was totally unaware. Yeah. And I wanted to be a basketball player. And it was the safest and easiest thing for me. And it was also a shield. I was a good enough player uh, that I, I didn't have to do anything else. Yeah. And I, I started playing against NBA players when I was 13 years old. Yeah. I used to coast. play against all the guys. We used to go to their games. They would come to our games. Yeah. Pat Riley married a girl from our high school. And the friendships that you make through sports, you know, they, the, yeah. the value of sports in our lives. When, when uh, I'm always sick, Rick, I'm always sick of something or somebody, but I have learned over the course of being sick my whole life and spending half my life in the hospital spending all my life in chronic pain, I, I know what my medicine is. And you know, for me, my medicine is participation in a team concept with the guys in physical activity. The enablement, the empowerment, the joy, the celebration, the happiness that comes with doing that, and then listening to the music play. Well, uh, and, and, and the music is always going in my mind. Our house in San Diego, where my parents still live to this day, my dad has passed away 16 years ago. But my mom, still in the same house, full with music all the time, classical music. But then I quickly gravitated to rock and roll. Honor, sacrifice, and discipline. We see the failures in the world all the time. Deceit, dishonesty, lies, and hypocrisy. We can't offer much during this time of crisis, but we can offer what we have. So from all of us working early mornings on the farm, long days in the plant, or late nights stocking shelves, doing all we can to get you the milk you need, we hope it makes your breakfast a little brighter, your snacks more nutritious, and reminds you when it comes to caring, there is no expiration date. Milk, love what's real. There's a rumor that you, is it over a thousand? How many dead concerts? Rumors. Uh, no, such thing as rumors. This is yeah. fact. Oh, this is it's truth. fact coming from Walton, which this has to be fact. Fact. So it's less than 1,300, but over 850. Somebody said it's 850. It, it, it's, it's, no, no, it's, it's over 1,000 now. Yes. Right. So right. I've been a deadhead since 1967. I was right. 14, 15 years old and heard them on the radio. This was the transition from AM to FM radio. Wow. And so we had this moment in our lives where we're just all hanging out because we were on the go. You know, the sun would come up and all the guys were out in the street all day long, playing ball, riding our bikes, going to the beach, playing Frisbee, and just having the time of our life. And then we had the radio going, and then AM, Chick Hearn, Lakers. Right. And then FM. The Dead. The Dead. Are, are you Jefferson Starship, uh, uh, Rolling Stones, but let's talk about Bob the dead. Dylan, Neil all Young, John Fogarty, are they all Rolling alive? Stones. Are they all alive? They're all alive. They're all, they're, they're, but they haven't lost, the, nobody's lost their voice, especially the dead. Are you a better basketball player than the dead is a trucking band? The similarities. That's an interesting answer that way. Are the same. Yeah. The, the, the group dynamics. What makes a group successful? Honor, sacrifice, and discipline. We see the failures in the world all the time. Deceit, dishonesty, lies, and hypocrisy. If hypocrisy were food, there would be no hunger. And the lack of honor, it, it just, it, it destroys things. And I am always standing at the fork in the road and yeah. the choices that we make. And so the, the, the choices that I made to, to be a fan of the Grateful Dead, to be a fan of Bob Dylan and Neil Young and John Fogarty and Jimmy Cliff and Jackson Brown and the Beach Boys and the Stones and John Lennon and George Harrison and Ringo I'm ready to cry. And, and Paul and all these guys <laughs> who, who sing the songs of okay. life, right. of joy, of happiness. And this was all reflected through the culture of the sport that I played in and that I watched and listened to, and the messenger was Chick Hearn. Yep. And the, 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 just the greatest broadcaster. And Chick was who I wanted to be because Chick could talk the way I was thinking. I love speed. I love it fast. I love drums. I love piano. I love basketball. I love the fight for the ball. I love racing up and down. I love riding my bike. I love all that kind of stuff that requires constant motion and to have the melody yeah. 
and then the lyrics and the purpose and the meaning. I, I grew up through basketball with a life of hope, opportunity, and purpose. That transitioned over now 67 years to include pride, loyalty, and gratitude. And I am most appreciative of all the sacrifice of Bill Russell and Muhammad Ali and Spencer Haywood and, and, and Wilt Chamberlain and all the guys, John Wooden. And, and, and to get to meet all these guys, it was tr truly remarkable. How do you define success? What, what does it mean to win? What does it look like? What does it feel like? This is not about baseball. It's dedication. It's commitment. It's about developing a mindset in our youth. A mindset that transforms into true character. Old habits abandoned. Disadvantaged. Distressed. New fields envisioned as new opportunities. Instructors teaching life. Lesson learned. This is not about baseball. Help us make an impact on the lives of children in need. Go to ripkinfoundation.org forward slash donations and make a difference. I was super lucky, Rick, in that I knew about the value of the team from the very beginning. Yeah. Through my parents, through Rocky, my first coach, through Chick Hearn, and then through John Wooden. This umbrella that was over my entire life of people always looking out for little Billy. And then have Bill Russell and Muhammad Ali, who were right yeah. there. Bob Dylan, Jerry Garcia, Neil Young, who were always singing about their concerns, living their concerns, for the least among us. I was unaware growing up of the challenges that so many people face without having a great home life, without having a great school, without having a great support system. You learn as you mature and grow old that, hey, privilege, that connotes responsibility, duty, and obligation. And ultimately, it all leads to that life of honor which we uh, try to live on a constant basis. And this was, the, this was the last and the hardest lesson that I've finally accumulated from John Wooden. Because he taught us all this stuff that was just racing around in our heads. And you know, he had the four laws yeah. of learning, um, demonstration, imitation, correction, repetition. And just everything was just going full speed. But he would always come back to this thought you know, how do you define success? What, what does it mean to win? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And he would always say the same thing, and it made no sense to me. And he would say, success is the peace of mind that comes with the self-satisfaction of knowing that you've done your best. And none of that, that's super easy to memorize, yeah. but none of it made any sense until very recently and I was preparing for an event, and I didn't understand what the event was. And so I reached out to one of my old teammates who had also played for John Wooden and who had lived this roller coaster ride as we all do. 
and we were kind of going through what the purpose and what the goal, what the scenario was going to be like at this event that I was going to be the featured speaker. And this guy who's older than I am and who's been there and done that, he kept coming back to me and he's saying, Bill, it's the peace of mind. It's the peace of mind that comes from the self-satisfaction of knowing that you've done your best. And so, well, I'm never satisfied and I'm never confident and I'm never happy with the job that I do, I am getting better at trying to reach that state of mind that comes from the peace of mind, self-satisfaction, knowing that you've done your best. That's what I try to do each and every day in everything that I do. It's the player's job and it's the parent's job to pick the right coach. And if you're not happy with your coach, there's lots of coaches out there. You've got to find your coach and that endless, relentless search. It's been 20 years since we planted our first vines at Max Creek, and we're still in love with every step of the winemaking process. But if you haven't been to see us in Lexington lately, there's some new things to experience along the banks of Spring Creek, like hard cider, and craft beer on tap, along with all your traditional favorites. And on our outdoor patio, every sip tastes even better. So bring the family. Our family is waiting for you at Max Creek. I got one quick basketball question for you. Will anybody win 88 games in a row in college basketball ever again? Yes. Records are made to be broken, and these great coaches that we have, Mike Krzyzewski, all these guys are your great friends, Rick, uh, John Calipari, Coach Williams at North Carolina, Bill Self at Kansas is excellent. There's so many great coaches, and one of the messages that I always try to deliver, as we did here in the gym before we started this yeah. with the players who were yeah, here, cool. is it's the player's job and it's the parent's job to pick the right coach. And if you're not happy with your coach, there's lots of coaches out there, you've got to find your coach and that endless, relentless search to find and learn from those master teachers. I was lucky. I mean, John Wooden was right there. Here's the thing, Wilt, who set all the records. And then people caught him, yeah, right? That's fair. And then Wilt, first of all, when they started to catch him, Wilt was still alive when they first started. Yeah. And he said, if I ever thought that people were going to catch my records, I would have just doubled them up and yeah, never right. discount anything that Will Chamberlain ever said. And what he also said was about the records being broken. Will said, never forget that in today's game, they keep changing the rules to make it easier. When I, Will Chamberlain, played, when I played, they changed every rule to make it harder for me. The beauty of sport is that it, it teaches you everything about life and, and, and it's decided right out in front of you. And what uh, uh, our four children, our nine grandchildren are doing, there's nothing like the pride of a dad, nothing like the pride of a grandfather. I'll tell you why I'm proud. I'm proud to have spent the last hour with him. Thank you, my friend. As you can clearly see, there is and will only be one Bill Walton. That's it for Icons this month. Next month, another Hall of Famer, but this time from the gridiron. New York Jets legend, Curtis Martin. Just to give a little background, uh, my grandmother, who was like my mother, who lived in that area, we found her murdered. When you were how old? Nine years old. Uh, since then, I probably had uh, 35 to 40 friends or family members that have not just died, but have been murdered. Last year, I was there, and I was visiting this house uh, of a family that I used to stay at a lot when I was younger. And I decided that since I had my three and five-year-old girls with me and my wife, that I would take them by the field to show them where daddy used to play mm -hmm. football when he was younger. Uh, we rode up there, had good conversation with a few people, stayed for maybe 10, 15 minutes. When I left, I got a text that said a little girl had just got shot in the head and shot in the foot. And the one thing that struck me was that it's been like this since I was a kid, and, which is almost four decades ago. And I just wanted to start the process of bringing some type of safety to that environment so that kids could 
go out there and play a game of football and not have to worry about returning home safe. Until then, I'm Rick Haro. See you next time on the Icons Leadership in Sports.